Now and then someone asks me why I'm endeavoring to interfere with the religious faith of others. Why I try to take from the world the consolation naturally arising from a belief in eternal fire. And I answer, I want to do what little I can to make my country truly free. I want to broaden the intellectual horizon of all people. I want it so we can differ on all those questions and yet grasp each other's hands in genuine friendship. I want, in the first place, to free the clergy. I'm a great friend of theirs, but they don't seem to have found it out generally. I want it so that every minister will not be a parrot, not an owl sitting upon a dead limb of the tree of knowledge and hooting the hoots that have been hooted for 1800 years. But I want it so that each one can be an investigator, a thinker, and I want to make his congregation grand enough so that they will not only allow him to think, but they will demand that he shall think and give to them the honest truth of his thought. As it is now, ministers are employed like attorneys, for the plaintiff or the defendant. If a few people know of a young man in the neighborhood, maybe who has not a good constitution, he may not be healthy enough to be wicked. A young man is so no decided talent, it occurs to them to make him a minister. They contribute and send him to some school. And if it turns out the young man has more of the man in him than they thought, and he changes his opinion, everyone who contributed will feel himself individually swindled, and they will follow the young man to the grave with poison shafts of malice and slander. I want it so that everyone will be free, so that a pulpit will not be a pillory. They have in Massachusetts, at a place called Andover, a kind of minister factory. And every professor of that factory takes an oath once in every five years. That is as long as an oath will last. That not only has he not doing the last five years, but so help him God, he will not do in the next five years intellectually advance. And probably there is no oath he could easier keep. Since the foundation of that institution there has not been one case of perjury. They believe in the same creed they first taught when the foundation stone was laid. And now and then when they send out a minister, they brand him as hardware from Sheffield and Birmingham. And every man who knows where he was educated knows every argument of his creed every book that he reads, and just what he amounts to intellectually, and knows he will shrink and shrivel and become solemnly stupid day after day until he meets his death. It is all wrong. It is cruel. These men should be allowed to grow. They should have the air of liberty and the sunshine of thought. I want to free the schools of our country. I want it so that when a professor of a college finds some fact inconsistent with Moses, he will not hide the fact that it will not be worse for him for having discovered the fact. I wish to see an eternal divorce and separation between church and schools. The common school is the bread of life, but there should be nothing taught in schools except what somebody knows, and anything else should not be maintained by a system of general taxation. I want as professors so they will tell everything they find, that they will be free to investigate in every direction, and will not be trammeled by the superstitions of our day. What has religion got to do with facts? Nothing. Is there anything such as Methodist mathematics, Presbyterian botany, Catholic astronomy or Baptist biology? What has any form of superstition or religion to do with any fact or with any science? Nothing but to hinder, delay, or embarrass. I want then to free the schools. I want to free the politicians so that a man will not have to pretend he is a Methodist or his wife a Baptist or his grandmother a Catholic so that he can go through a campaign and when he gets through will find none of the dust of hypocrisy on his knees. I want to make the people splendid enough that when they desire men to make laws for them, they will take someone who knows something, who has brain enough to prophesy the destiny of the American Republic, no matter what his opinions may be on any religious subject. Suppose we are in a storm out at sea and the billows are washing over our ship and it is necessary someone should reef the topsail and the man presents himself. Would you stop him at the foot of the mast and find out his opinion on the five points of Calvinism? What has that to do with it? Congress has nothing to do with baptism or any particular creed. And for what little experience I've had in Washington, very little to do with any kind of religion whatever. Now I hope this afternoon this magnificent and splendid audience will forget that they are Baptists or Methodists and remember that they are men and women. These are the highest titles humanity can bear. Man and woman. And every title you add belittles them. Man is the highest. Woman is the highest. Let us remember that we are simply human beings with interest in common. And yet all of us remember that our views depend largely on the country in which we happen to live. Suppose we were born in Turkey. Most of us would have been Mohammedans. 
and when we read in the book when Muhammad visited heaven, he became acquainted with an angel named Gabriel, who was so broad between his eyes that it would take a smart camel 300 days to make the journey, we probably would have believed it. If we did not, people would say, that young man is dangerous. He is trying to tear down the fabric of our religion. What do you propose to give us instead of that angel? We cannot afford to trade off an angel that size for nothing. Or if we had been born in India, we would have believed in a god with three heads. Now we believe in three gods with one head. And so we might make a tour of the world and see that every superstition that could be imagined by the brain of man has been in some place held to be sacred. Now someone says, the religion of my father and mother is good enough for me. Suppose we all said that. Where would be the progress of the world? We would have the rudest and most barbaric religion, which no one could believe. I do not believe that it is showing real respect for our parents to believe something simply because they did. Every good father and every good mother wishes their children to find out more than they knew. Every good father wants his son to overcome some obstacle that he could not grapple with. And if you wish to reflect credit on your father and your mother, do it by accomplishing more than they did, because you live in a better time. Every nation has had what you call sacred record. And the older and more sacred, the more contradictory and the more inspired is the record. We, of course, are not an exception. And I propose to talk a little about what is called the Pentateuch, a book or collection of books said to have been written by Moses. And right here in the commencement, let me say that Moses never wrote one word of the Pentateuch. Not one word had been written until he had been dust and ashes for hundreds of years. But as a general opinion, it is Moses that wrote these books. I have entitled this lecture, The Mistakes of Moses. For the sake of this lecture, we will admit that he wrote it. Nearly every maker of religion is commenced by making the world, and it is one of the safest things to do, because no one can contradict as having been present, and this gives free scope to the imagination. These books, in times when there was a vast difference between the educated and the ignorant, became inspired, and the people bowed down and worshipped them. I saw a little while ago a Bible with immense oaken covers, with hasp and class large enough almost for a penitentiary. And I can imagine how that book would be regarded by barbarians in Europe when they had not more than one person in a dozen could read and write. In fancy, I saw it carried into the cathedral. I heard the chant of the priest, saw the swinging of the censer and the smoke rising. And when the Bible was put on the altar, I can imagine the barbarians looking at it and wondering what influence that black book would have on their lives in the future. I do not wonder that they imagined it was inspired. None of them could write a book, and consequently when they saw it, they adored it. They were stricken with awe, and the rascals took advantage of that awe. Now, they say that book was inspired. I do not care whether it is or not. The question is, is it true? If it is true, it don't need to be inspired. Nothing needs inspiration except a falsehood or a mistake. A fact never went into partnership with a miracle. Truth scorns assistance of wonders. A fact will fit every other fact in the universe. That is how you can tell whether it is or is not a fact. And lie will not fit anything, except for another lie made for the express purpose. And finally, someone gets tired of lying, and the last lie will not fit the next lie. And then there is a chance for inspiration. Right then and there, a miracle is needed. The real question is, in the light of science, in the light of the brain, in the light of the heart of the 19th century, is this book true? The gentleman who wrote it began by telling us that God made the universe out of nothing. That I cannot conceive. It may be so, but I cannot conceive it. Nothing, regarded in the light of raw material, is to my mind a decided and disastrous failure. I cannot imagine of nothing being made into something, any more than I can imagine something being changed back into nothing. I cannot conceive of force aside from matter. Because force to be force must be active. And unless there is matter, there is nothing for force to act upon. So consequently, it cannot be active. So I simply say I cannot comprehend it. I cannot believe it. I may roast for this, but it is my honest opinion. The next thing he proceeds to tell us is that God divided the darkness from the light. Right here, let me say when I speak about God, I simply mean the being described by the Jews.